I am the proud owner of a 1995 Eclipse GSX, and I know that it doesn't look like much now, but the car has good bones, and I love DSMs and have wanted to make one my own for a very, very long time. Now, I'm determined to make this car fast and reliable, so over the last few months, I've been fixing everything on the car, and I've been making it go faster by throwing a ton of performance parts at it. I've installed a more efficient intercooler system, free-flowing intake, larger turbocharger, and much more. So in this video, I'm gonna throw even more performance parts at my Eclipse, and I've heard that when you make a car faster, you're like supposed to make it handle and stop better or something like that. So I guess we should upgrade the brakes and the suspension. So without further ado, let's get to work. All right, now before we go and make this car faster, it's not going anywhere with a hole in the fuel line. So we need to fix this. Now this is the main feed fuel line right off of the sender unit. So it threads in there and eventually sends fuel all the way to the fuel injectors. And after I filmed my last Eclipse video, it just popped. It's an old hose and that happens sometimes. Now I wanted to make a steel braided line with some AN fittings, but they won't fit on the factory sending unit. And I was able to find this fitting here, which will convert this to an AN style fitting. So we'll screw it on there and then we'll be able to connect our hose there. Now, since I'm gonna be running E85, we are going with the PTFE fuel hose. You can see the inside there. This is gonna hold up to ethanol and we just need a couple of straights. It's nice we have our example piece. So we'll bring this hose right up to about there and we should be good right there. And then I like to take some black electrical tape and wrap the area we're just about to cut. Slice. And this way when we cut the hose, it won't fray. Eventually we'll need these nice vice jaw attachments to hold our AN lines, but they also work really well at holding the hose. Screw that down right about there. Many ways to skin a cat, but I like to cut this hose with a cutoff wheel. Wear safety equipment right in the middle of our tape. And go slow, don't rush this, and it'll help with the frame. There we go. That stinks. Now when we remove the tape, we don't have any frame. I've already fit our hose with one new end. Well, let me show you how we do this side. So if you unscrew this fitting, you will find a little collar in here that is called the olive, and we need to fit that inside of here. So before you do anything, you wanna make sure that you have this collar just chilling in the back. I've done this by hand, but they also make a really nice tool like this that we can use. It centers right into the hose and then allows you to twist and push the olive underneath the black braid and over that Teflon liner that we see. And then when you're done, it will bottom out on the inside of the collar. Spray this with a little silicone spray. And now we can take the other end and push it right through. This can require a little bit of force, but it will snap in like that. And now we're gonna hold this all together with this nut. We'll thread it on by hand as far as we can go. Then we'll use our special vise to hold the line and we'll tighten it up. They do make special wrenches so you don't scratch the anodized finish, but you can use normal wrenches if you're careful. Snug it up like that and we're done. All right. There you have it. We have made our own custom DSM fuel sending unit fuel hose. So we went from this to this, and I think the DSM gods would, would be proud. I've tightened up this fitting, so now we can feed our new line in, just like this. Tight quarters here, very tight quarters. Oh, I dropped it. After a little finagling, I got it on. So we'll tighten this end up. And then with another adapter underneath the car on the other end of the line, we have connected our new hose, so we should be good. Well, let's check for leaks and give it a prime. All right, we're good, no more fuel leaks. Let's go make this thing faster. With our fuel line fixed, it's time to make all of these parts disappear. So we are gonna be doing some massive upgrades to the fuel system in preparation for E85. So this is a flex fuel sensor that I'll be installing. We have 1300 cc fuel injectors, a boost reference fuel pressure regulator, and much more. So let's start taking stuff apart. First things first, I'm gonna remove the fuel rail with the injectors. Let's pop off some spark plug wires for easier access. All right, these are all labeled, so we're not messing around later. We'll tuck these out of the way. And now we can start disconnecting the fuel injectors. I gotta say some fuel injector connectors are a big pain in the butt, not the ones on the Eclipse. These are beautiful. I mean, 1995 people, look at how nice these are. Say whatever you want about Mitsubishi, but their injector clips, 
top notch. Next, we have two 10 millimeter bolts holding the fuel line that comes from the factory fuel filter to the rail. All right, easy enough. We'll pull this guy out, lose a little bit of fuel, and then we can actually pull this line out like so. And we're actually gonna replace this line right now. So now we can remove the bolt at the fuel filter. Woo. Look at all that. And here she is, old fuel line. So much like the fuel hose that failed at the sending unit, this can do the same, it's just as old. And I guess this one rupturing is really common and it's under the hood. So we're getting rid of this, we're upgrading it. So I got a really nice kit from Extreme PSI and it comes with these fitting adapters so you can use the factory rail and we're gonna be going with an adjustable fuel pressure regulator too. So now since we've removed the banjo bolt that works with the factory style line, we can install this and it'll screw right into the top of the fuel filter and this end is 6AN for our new braided hose. And we'll snug this guy up like that. Then we can tighten the AN fitting on right here. But for now, we're gonna leave this loose and out of the way because we still need to remove the fuel rail. This is the factory fuel pressure regulator. So we'll take off its reference. I already loosened up the clamp here. So now we can slide this hose off like that. And now we can remove the three 12 millimeter bolts that hold on the rail. All right, there we go. Now we should be able to pull these guys up and out of here. There we go. Injectors are out and these do look kind of aftermarket. Yeah, these are 450 cc injectors. I found some posts online that these were factory injectors and maybe not this engine, but some other engine. And they were a popular upgrade on the Eclipse if you were just doing little bolt-ons and stuff. But we're going a lot bigger than 450 cc. Now fitting your engine more fuel is cool. And so is feeding your lawn with Sunday. And it's easy too. just screw your garden hose onto the pouch, open the valve, and just like that, your lawn is getting what it needs to grow stronger and greener. So this is what my lawn looked like before Sunday. It was pretty embarrassing. And this is what my lawn looked like after just one year of using Sunday. I also wanted to show you guys my lawn before a cut to show you how well this grows. It comes in nice and thick and crowds out most of the weeds like Dan dandelions, but if you do have an issue with that, they have a great product for that called Dandelion Doom. I used it on one of my neighbor's houses that needed just a little help. Sunday is your one-stop shop for all your lawn care needs, and they have everything, including seed and much, much more. They base your needs off your geographical location and even send you a soil sample kit so they can fine tune the nutrient pouches even more. Sunday is shipped for free right to your door with easy instructions. And if you have any questions, you can call Call or text Sunday and a real live human being will respond. It's amazing. But the best part is if you click on my link down below or go to getsunday.com slash legit and use coupon code legit 30, you're going to get 30% off your very own custom lawn care plan. This is by far the biggest sale they've ever had. So take advantage. My guys at Fuel Injector Connection sent out some 1300 cc fuel injectors. So these should be a direct bolt in swap. Oh, this is really nice. Same length and the connector is the same as well. So no adapters. I've gotten a ton of fuel injectors from these guys and it's really neat because they send you a little thumb drive with the injector data card because each injector is flowed and can be slightly different. And this way the tuner can zip it into the tune and it is spot on and will just run perfectly. So that's huge. If you guys are doing injectors, definitely get the injector data card or data card, depending on, on how you say that. Let's go ahead and swap these out. Okay, that came out pretty easy. Look at how bad this seal is. Wow, nothing in the rail, but I'll blow it out anyway. Pull these other guys out. That seal looks pretty good. That, okay, is there a seal here? Oh yeah, there it is. All right, hold injectors are out. Let's remove the fuel pressure regulator. There you go. Thank you, factory fuel pressure regulator. You've done a great job. It's just so good at regulating fuel pressure. With the rail stripped down, we can blow the layer into it. And we're looking pretty good, super clean in there. And now we can prep this bad boy with some new parts before it goes back in. You know, we got the MB sunroof grease and in the regulator kit, you get these adapters for our AN lines. And we'll reuse the factory hardware. So there's one side for the feed and one side for the return, like that. We'll lubricate our O-rings on both ends. These injectors already have an adapter with a clip, so they're just going to fit right in like this. Here's the rail with all of the injectors. 
And it's time to go back in and should just slide right in. Make sure the old O-rings aren't stuck in your intake. Once you're confident that all the injectors are pushed in all the way, you can start reinstalling your bolts. And I gotta say, they're not messing around with keeping this fuel rail down. It's gigantic bolts and three of them at that. Little overkill, but I'll take it. And then just make sure to hand tighten. Don't have to go crazy with this. That's good. Fuel rail is torqued down. The injectors are plugged in. And now it's time for our Aeromotive fuel pressure regulator. So I'd like this to fit somewhere in this general vicinity. And I like using factory bolts and we have quite a few on the firewall. Now, it'd be nice to use these two because they almost seem to line up perfectly, but it would be sticking up too much and the AC line is in the way. This only really needs one bolt. It's not heavy. So this would work. Well, we need a way longer bolt. I don't even know what this is for, to be honest with you. Hang on, hang on. I have a bracket that might work better because this has one ear, which is all we're gonna be using up top. Let's swap these guys. I'm gonna remove these bolts. Will this line up? Yes. All right, let's see. Okay, we definitely need to get some kind of spacer out here, I think, but this is gonna be way too close to here. If only this ear was on this side. All right, I brought the bracket over to the metal fabrication department and we're gonna tighten it down in the machine and then we'll come in with our jaws. Now I'll hit the button for the hydraulics to bend this. Perfect, and now we need to bend this one back too. All right, there we go. All right, our modified bracket is back on the fuel pressure regulator. And so how this works is the hose at the end of the fuel rail is gonna go in right here. This port gets blocked off. And then on the bottom is the return back to the fuel line to the tank. And so let's remove the last piece of factory hose. I had to cut this one off of the fuel line because it was just frozen on there. This has become very hard over the years. So that is it. This is the very last piece of the rubber fuel hose on this car. The rest of it is steel. And because this car is from Arizona, it's in excellent condition. All right, let's make sure our regulator fits in here with the larger line on right in there. Oh yeah, we're gonna be good. Gotta make sure this stuff won't interfere with the hood. So as long as it's under here, it's perfect. I'm also gonna be using a gauge, which we'll screw in there. And we have plenty of room for that too. And really the last piece of our fuel system puzzle would be this, a GM ethanol sensor, because I'll be running E85. This Eclipse will be flex fuel. And many people will install these right in the middle of a return fuel line, but you can also install them in a feed line. And I have a ton more real estate right here with the feed rather than down there with the regulator. I've marked off with a little bit of tape where we need to cut in order to splice in our sensor. These are both done and looking pretty. Now check this out, this is really neat. See this adapter right here? It's needed because from the factory, these use a totally different end. So typically these are used with a line that looks like this and then it just pushes right in. But since we've converted everything to 6AN, they sell these fittings and one end has a little slot that goes on this side and it's threaded and then all you do Push this on, it's got a little O-ring in there, and you thread it on. Tighten these two up with a wrench and you've now adapted a GM ethanol sensor to use 6AN line. And something else I wanna show you is that this flex fuel sensor doesn't restrict much flow. Guys are able to put these on the feed side of the system up to about 1200 horsepower on E85. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with putting it on the return side that is a lower pressure side. I guess if you had to say which one was more ideal, it would be the return side, but in this case, it won't make any difference at all. Well, unless I make 1200 horsepower, that would be quite the surprise. Here's our final product for the new feed with ethanol sensor in line. And I did replace the fuel filter as well. So we're all set there. Now we just need to get our new return hose onto the regulator like so. And I'm gonna be using traditional style hose clamps this time. I don't hate this style hose clamp, but when it's buried deep in an engine compartment, it's just, it's hard to get to. We are almost there. It is fuel pressure gauge time. We'll screw this right onto the regulator. All right, that's done. Now let's mount this bad boy. See what it looks like. That's lining up pretty good. Since the factory regulator is also boost referenced, I just needed to extend the hose there and we're all plugged in. All right, so everything is all done. Injectors are in, regulator mounted, everything looking good. Well. I mean, maybe not yet. Let's prime the fuel system, make sure we don't have any leaks. All right, 
That sounded pretty good. Um, I heard a lot of the air coming out. No leaks at the rail. No leaks here. Oh, we got we got a little leak. We got a little leak. There's always a little leak. Yeah, <laughs> I figured it out. I tightened the line, but I didn't tighten the fitting into the regulator. See, it's pretty loose. Okay, there we go. I actually totally did that on purpose to like show you guys what would happen if you left a line or a fitting loose because I, I would never do that. All right, let's try that one more time. Okay, there we go. Yep, no leaks. And it is primed and holding. Our Eclipse GSX fuel system is complete. And if you guys were around for the last video, you know we have a big Hellcat fuel pump in the tank as well that will support at least 707 horsepower because that's what the Hellcat has, but probably even more than that. So this is a very stout little fuel system. It will be flex fuel, but in order to start it, we need to upload a new tune because right now it's tuned for the 450s. So if we were to start it right now with 1300 cc fuel injectors, the computer would still pulse it the same amount of time, but it would get like three times as much fuel. It would dilute the oil, the engine would just completely explode and blow up and the welds on the intake manifold will also blow up and then like a sheet metal floor thingy will fall out and then you will shift gears like 12 times. That's what happened in Fast and Furious. First step of the tune is having a battery charger connected. You don't want a low voltage situation when you're flashing the engine's computer. And uh, yeah, the back of the Eclipse has turned into like the steel braided line factory. I have like a lot of parts in here that need to move you know, to storage. Anyway, we have our OBD plugged in. We're gonna open up our ECM link. We will connect. And the Tuning Twins sent me a tune file. Let's download. Now that we have the file with all the changes, we can copy to ECU. Not a whole lot was changed here because all I did was the injectors and we already had a base tune for everything else. But I learned that we cannot fire this thing up just yet or we could be in big trouble. Check this out. You guys see this right here? It's an injector resistor pack. And this is the plug for it. It has five wires. One is a 12 volt power source and then the others go to the fuel injectors. Now you may be pondering to yourself, Alex, why is there a resistor box? We've never seen that before. Well, it all boils down to the fact that the DSM had two different style injector options depending on which model car you got. So the turbocharged GSM and Talon TSI and so forth, they got low impedance injectors and the non-turbo cars got high impedance injectors. And now you may be pondering, Alex, what in the world is the difference? Or maybe like, what am I gonna eat today? You, you could not care about impedance. But either way, I'm gonna tell you all about it. Low impedance or peak and hold injectors are sent 56 amps of current. And once they open, they drop to 23 amps. This is great for opening and closing the injector quickly, but it also creates a lot of heat. High impedance or saturated injectors are only sent 11 and a half amps, which keeps them cooler, thus more reliable, which is why most all manufacturers use them on modern cars. Now back in the day, guys that wanted a ton of horsepower would actually revert back to low impedance injectors and they'd have to run a driver box or a resistor box like we see on the Eclipse. And that's because those injectors were really good at flowing a lot of fuel. But since technology has progressed quite a bit, we now have high impedance injectors that can flow all the fuel in the world and still run cooler. So low impedance has kind of been phased out for the most part. So we will be eliminating this resistor box simply by cutting and splicing. There are two 10 millimeter nuts to remove this resistor box. There we go. Come on out, little buddy. You're done resisting. Wait, it's like literally resisting right now. It will not come out. Stop resisting. Oh, ow. Oh, this thing is not going out without a fight. Oh, you've done your job. You've resisted all sorts of amperage for our low impedance injectors. I think impedance is now one of my favorite words. Just, just say it with me, people. Impedance. So here you can see the five wires that go into the box. One of them is that 12 volt, and then it reduces the amperage and sends it right back out to the injector. So right now the car won't start because it's sending the wrong amperage. They do sell an adapter plug, but if you guys wanna save some money, you can just chop this off. We're not gonna need this anymore. Then we're gonna use these awesome wire strippers and go down the line here and strip them all. You've been stripped. Ah, I have no more insulation. I'm naked. That's right, wires. You are all gonna come together now. It's not just gonna be one of you bringing in all the amps and then you guys, after getting dumbed down with lower amperage, get to send it out to the injectors and act like the hero. That's not what's gonna happen because now you are one. And we're gonna use a solder joint on this one. Normally these are used to mend two wires together, but we're gonna do things a little differently around here, aren't we? Now we can melt this solder. There we go. 
Once you start seeing it kind of spewing out, you know it's getting in there in between the wires. That's pretty good. And then we'll melt the end here so that it is fully weatherproof. And I'll kind of just smush this together. Make sure it's 100%. There we go. We've just created our own bypass. Now we can plug this guy in like that. This actually has a pretty decent spot where it's held in. And now our engine should start. All right, let's see how this goes. Fires right up. That's good. Yeah. Okay, it's not running the best right now. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's shaking. Uh, yeah, okay, it died. Well, that's okay, let's fire this up again. And we're gonna send the tuner a quick log. Press this button here. We're gonna begin a capture of it running rough. I can tell you right away, it's super lean. I think they're gonna have to add a little bit more fuel. Yeah, oh yeah, very lean. But you know what, before we get too crazy, let's see if we can activate the fuel pump miscellaneous and we're going to click on activate fuel pump always on there we go oh and you know what this is set up about right base pressure is 43 and a half so we're right there that's not the issue i'm going to send that log file back i'll get a revision probably with some more fuel and we'll see what happens we've gone back and forth on three tune revisions this should be good now oh fire's right up It's already running way smoother than before. And our AFR is right in line. This is perfect. Now that we have my GSX running well with a massively increased power potential because of the fuel system, it is time. It is time to get rid of these, all right? These served their purpose for the last 20 something years, but we need new wheels, we need new tires, we need new brakes. The brakes on this thing are, are pretty small, especially with the fact that I'm hoping for about 450, 500 all wheel, and this is a pretty light car. We need big brakes, and they look cool. So I'm taking a page from my Turbo Trans Am WS6. It is also a white car, so I figured I'd copy the brakes. These are the brakes. These are 2004 to 2007 CTSV Cadillac Brembo brakes, and so are these. So a much larger brake caliper, a much larger rotor, and we're gonna lower the Eclipse with some coilovers. Be gone. Ooh. Okay, do you guys know what's going on here? My Eclipse kind of looks like a cow. I don't know exactly what this is. Maybe someone put some kind of undercoating on here and it flaked away. I, I don't know guys, is this normal for this car? Either way, I'll get it fixed when the car gets painted. This was a Nevada car. It spent its entire life in the desert. I don't know if that matters, but weird. First step in upgrading your brakes is removing your old brakes. A couple of caliper bolts. Ah, uh, this is so great. They're not frozen in. Yes, I love Nevada desert cars. All right, 240,000 mile brake caliper, not leaking. You've done a great job. Ooh, wow, you did a really good job. These pads, ooh, I needed brakes anyway. Look at that, barely anything left. Get the pads out of here and then a couple of caliper bracket bolts. Like butter. Love tap? Medium love tap? Anger tap. That didn't work. Remembering that you always wanted to be a baseball player, but weren't good enough to make the freshman high school team. I thought I was pretty good, but I wasn't good enough for the freshman high school team. Talk about shattered dreams. But anyway, I'm gonna shatter this rotor. Ah, it worked, see? That was a good swing, high school coach. Coach, I don't remember his name, Gale? No. That wasn't him. Coach Gale was a nice guy. I don't remember, but I should have been on that team. Anyway, I don't think about that at all. <laughs> Look at the size difference of these rotors. This is gonna be awesome. But hang on, there's no way the dust shield is going to fit or do anything with these, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the rotor is much bigger than the dust shield, which is bigger than the factory rotors. So that's okay. We're gonna take this off. That's fine to do, especially in a car like this that I'm not driving year round. I haven't had the dust shields on the Trans Am well for almost my entire adult life. I bought that car when I was 18. And yeah, actually, if you guys wanna see super early YouTube Alex, the whole reason I started this channel was to show people on LS1 Tech, an old forum that I used to be on all the time, how to do the CTS-V brakes on a fourth gen Camaro or Firebird. That's my second video, and it was my inspiration, I guess. I was on LS1 Tech all the time, like talking to people, how, this is how you do this, and then I would gain a bunch of information too. So I'm like, let me make a video. And here we are, here we are, the rest is history. All thanks to the Trans Am. But anywho, let's remove the 10 millimeter holding this shield on. I think that's all that holds it on. Okay. 
I would have to take the hub apart to remove this. Hang on. I'm not gonna do all of that because I think I replaced this hub. Yeah, I think I did all of them. We're just gonna cut this off. I'm never using it again anyway. There we go. She's gone. It was actually the rear hubs that I replaced. I didn't replace these. But other than being rusty, they're in really good shape. No play whatsoever. They feel really tight. Let's clean them up a tad. Actually, you know what would make this a lot easier? Getting these studs out of here. Goodbye, studs. Right into the garbage you go. We don't need those anymore because we need longer studs. I'll show you guys the wheels in a little bit and we're gonna be installing them after the brakes, but they're gonna require a little bit of a spacer. So we need longer studs for more threads. But anywho, let's clean this up. Much better. A little black paint, never hurt anybody. Doesn't look too bad, now this won't rust anymore. Here's what it looks like after the paint dries so it's not all shiny. It's more of a matte finish. Not that you're ever gonna see that, but now it's time for our studs. We'll push them in like this. And now there are many ways to press the stud into the flange, but this is a cheap and easy way. You take an old lug, we're not gonna use this as just a tool, and a flat washer. And you wanna lubricate these threads. You can use engine oil or whatever. I'm using caliper bolt grease because it was close by. Now we're gonna pull this in, make sure it's straight. Right when it bottoms out, you're done. And then we just remove our washer. This is just to protect the flange here. And there you have it. You have installed a longer wheel stud. Wheel studs are all done. And your final step is spraying them down with a little brake clean. You don't want anything on your studs when you bolt your wheels up. These should be totally dry. Now I did want to show you how to use the special tool. I ordered a new one and it didn't come in yet. So this is a, a good way to do it in a pinch. In my opinion, it is safe, but my official method of installing is with the proper tool. But let me, let me tell you why I think you're okay with this. A few things, these are hardened ARP studs, so they're stronger than the factory ones. And then also this is the only part of the stud that's used to pull it in. And that will never actually have a lug nut on it that will be done out in the middle and outer section of the stud. So you're not really affecting anything, but if you guys wanna see these threads up close, they're perfectly fine, but use the tool. Proper tools are always better. Next up, we have our gigantic rotors, but before we put those on, there is a bore size difference. So I bought a little adapter ring to make these fit a little bit more snug on the hub. There we go. Next is our beautiful CTS-V brake caliper. So these are four piston calipers and I will probably get rid of the V there. It doesn't make much sense on the Eclipse anymore, but wait till you see the wheels that I'm going with. I think they make a lot of sense with this silver color. So I might just paint over clear and call it a day. And these are brand new. And what's amazing is, these are a direct bolt-on for the, for the most part. I did have to get some longer hardware to work with the thicker caliper, but look at this. I don't have to do anything with the spindle. Just threads right in now. Tighten these guys up. And before putting the pads in, I ran into a little issue. If I push the rotor in where it's supposed to be, it is hitting the inside of the caliper here. So that is not good. You can see there's much more clearance on the other side. And I don't think it's a good idea to grind this area. That's where the pad sits. We could shave down the face of each caliper ear and that would effectively move the caliper this way. That would do it too. But I have an abundance of wheel spacers in storage. So I got an idea. I just removed the caliper. Let's take the rotor out. And I have a three and a half millimeter wheel spacer. And I'm gonna put that in here, reinstall the rotor. Now we've effectively spaced it out. And there you have it. Now we have a bunch of clearance. This is gonna be totally stationary. And on the top as well. What's kind of great about this option is that we didn't grind down anything on the caliper. You can do that if you're careful, you won't destroy you know, the strength of the caliper, but we didn't have to do any of that. And I know I have to space this out a little bit to fit the wheels that I'm going with anyway. So now we can run a little bit less of a spacer on this side. I'm gonna lubricate the back of the brake pad where the piston contacts so we don't get any squeaking and then we just slide these right in just like that numero due and then new hardware of course so you hold the pad retaining clip in and from the back side we'll install the pins just like that once that's holding itself in you can push this down there'll be quite a bit of pressure that's the point and then push this in like that and then you can gently tap the pins in sometimes it helps to use a punch too Pins are all done and oh man, this looks so cool. 
Look at these brakes. I know they're not the biggest brakes in the world to today's standards, but back in 1995 on a car like this, Oh, they look so good. I, I love the color. I wanna leave this color so bad. But let me show you guys the little ring in there. And basically this just kinda takes up the little gap so the rotor's not bouncing up and down. So that's a good idea. Although the, the wheel lugs will center it and everything, but why not? This is a good safety precaution. Oh, and then also these are Cobra Mustang brake rotors. So we have Cadillac calipers, Mustang brake rotors on a Mitsubishi. And I'll leave you guys a list of parts down below. I did research on this in order to figure out how to do it. And now I'm passing it along to you guys and it'll be nicely organized. So if you want to do this on your DSM, you can. And this stuff was really cheap. I think I'm going to have like maybe six to $700 into the entire front, which is pretty good for big brakes. With the brakes all squared away, it's time to replace the front strut. So we're gonna start off up top. And then we have a 17 on the bottom. Easy. Thank you engineers for putting the bolt in this way. It makes absolutely no sense. There we go. And I really got carried away with the brakes. These come off in a few minutes. It'll give us a ton more room. And I actually already put in the driver's side strut. I don't know if you guys noticed the green top when I was doing the whole fuel system, but when I got those, I test fit one over here. Next, we have a nut for the sway bar link, which is bolted to the strut. And the nut is actually coming off. This, this is a, a miracle. I tell myself this all the time, but I'm never buying cars from anywhere where they salt the road. This Nevada car, just everything falls apart. You guys who work on cars in these types of climates, California, Arizona, New Mexico, you know all the good states, you're so lucky, seriously. Very, very lucky. I don't know why I say things before I'm completely done with the job. I usually jinx myself, but no, I think we're gonna be all right here. Oh my gosh, I'm taking this off with my fingers now. It's amazing. Look at those beautiful threads. I jinxed myself, I, I can't get this out. Yeah, it's just, it's under tension. It's at a weird angle. Okay, I got the bottom off. I think fought me a little bit. Never saying that I am got lucky on anything again. All right, I jinxed myself, but we got a good sway bar link. That's good. Next, we're gonna remove the bolt for the upper control arm. And yeah, this uh, ball joint's seen better days. There we go. Yeah, that sprung up on me a little bit. <laughs> no big deal. We'll push this up even further. And now the strut will begin to come out. All right, out she comes. Goodbye, old friend. With our old strut out of the way, we can start to go back together with these bad boys right here. So I went with some teen, I think that's how you say this, <laughs> coilovers. So we can adjust the ride height with these very easily. And then we can adjust compression and rebound as well with this little knob right here, just right on the car. So I got these from my friends at fitmentindustries.com. You guys probably know of them for wheels and tires. They are your one-stop shop for that and for brakes and suspension suspension parts like our coilovers, great customer service, good prices. And they sent me these out and I'm really excited. They had some really good reviews and I think the install is gonna be super easy. All we have to do is swap this over to right here and then this is the rear and then we can adjust the ride height once we get the wheels and tires. And I think you guys are really gonna like those, but I'm not gonna like removing this bolt. It looks pretty bad. I gotta remember there's no rust, but again, I jinxed myself. I said this is gonna be really easy and then look at what I found. Spray a little penetrating oil on there. Let it soak for a minute. All right, now we're gonna hit it with the big gun. Wish me luck. Oh, I love it. I love it. There's no rust in there. It was just dirt. We're good. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I still have to take this off. Oh, not home free yet. No, it's hammer time. Da, na, 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 na. Can't touch this. Ah! I got it. Yay. All right, here is our strut fork. I'm gonna call it a strut fork. Yeah, looks good. We'll clean it up a little bit before it goes on those beauties right over there. They're green. Fork and bolt is all cleaned up and this should be pretty easy. This just slides right in here and you can see there's a slot at the bottom of the strut that the bolt slides through. So we'll go in like this and tighten it up. And now it is locked in and ready to go back on the car, which is like quite literally falling apart all the time. Yeah, this fell off as I was opening the door, but that's okay because I found a donor car that's got the updated second gen Eclipse front bumper, wing, side skirts, and everything. So I'm getting factory parts. And then when we go to the body shop, it'll all get painted. This car is gonna be mint. Well, before we put this nice looking strut in here, I wanna make the spindle look a little bit better. All right, looking pretty good. All right, so we went from this 
to this in just about two minutes, well worth it. And something I wanna show you guys is look over all of your hardware when you're putting steering and suspension back together. You don't always have to replace this stuff, but just take a look at the threads and you can kinda of see in there that this thread is a little damaged. And when I go to thread this on, it stops right there. You can fix this. Using the die out of a tap and die set would be ideal, but a lot of times with larger bolts, you won't have a die, but you can get a thread file like this for about $15 pretty much anywhere. I'll try and find some links for you guys down below. And then these will have many different thread styles. There's even more underneath the handle, but basically you can just match up the threads with the tool, find one that fits in perfectly. And then you're basically just filing the threads that are damaged. So just run the threads through and this will clean them up especially if the burr is really small. Then when you're done, your thread should look pretty close to perfect. And most importantly, your nut will thread on all the way by hand. That is important. You can always force this through with an impact, but then you might destroy all the other threads. So now we have a repaired bolt. And now we can get to the good stuff of reinstalling our strut. Watch the paint, repainting the car. So I don't have to worry too much, but watch the paint. Slide this up past the control arm. All right, all right, let's go up top and get some nuts in there to hold this all in place. All right, strut coming through. And now we're held up. That's perfect. That'll make life much easier down below when we try to line up that fork. So we'll leave these loose so we can kind of manipulate this just a tad. Okay, now we can push the lower control arm into place and we're putting the bolt in this way. This is much easier. Little love taps. And with a nut on the other end, I can tighten it up. Now we'll do the final tighten of this bolt once the car is on the ground with the wheels because you don't want to set the control arm in a twisted position. It'll wear out much quicker. But something we can't fully tighten up would be the three nuts up top. And I'm gonna go ahead and replace this front sway bar link while we're in there. And don't worry, I will be replacing this nasty upper ball joint. Just not yet, because I don't know what's going on with camber yet. I have to get the wheels and tires on here and see what the fitment looks like. And then I might have to get a different adjustable upper ball joint, or I might not, I don't know yet. Sway bar end links don't need a ton of torque. That's good. Now we can push the ball joint into the spindle. And you are definitely on your last leg, buddy. With the front coilover done, we can put the brakes back together for real this time. And I was holding off with the hose and removing this caliper so we didn't lose fluid everywhere. I just sprayed this down, let's hope it comes free. It's always best to use a line wrench on brake lines. You definitely don't want to round these out. Oh, nice, love it. Okay, line's coming up, that's free. Now the brake fluid will begin. So we just have a 12 mil for this bracket. And that way we can remove the entire caliper with the hose. Now I'm pretty sure you can use the factory hose, but they have over 200,000 miles, so we're gonna upgrade. And I wanna upgrade quickly because we're losing fluid here, people. There we go, threads right in. And then with the brakes back on, we can install our banjo bolt with crush washers on both sides, and it'll thread into the bottom of the caliper like this. Kind of straighten it out a little bit, there we go. Always tighten these by hand, never use an impact. You don't wanna strip out a nice caliper. Final piece of the puzzle is a 10 millimeter spacer that I know I'm gonna to need to clear these brakes with the new wheels. There's one last step when you're upgrading your brakes or replacing your brake calipers. And that of course is the brake bleed. You guys have seen me do this a bunch of times with my little pneumatic sucking device from Harbor Freight for 10 bucks. But since I didn't let all of the fluid leak out of the lines for very long, we're already seeing fluid without even turning this on. It's gravity bleeding. So we're gonna hit it like this. And that's yeah, hard to see, but the fluid is now going into this container. Sometimes when you do brand new calipers, you might need an assistant to push the brake down when you open the bleeder, have him hold it down, then you close the bleeder, then he goes up. Don't ever have him go up with the bleeder open or you're gonna suck a bunch of air in there. But I think this method in this case will work just fine. All right, the brakes are pretty much bled, but I wanna be sure. So we got Max pushing the brake pedal down. So I get to show you guys how to do this in the buddy system method. All right, so I'm gonna open the bleeder, then I'm gonna say open, and then Max is gonna say down. And he pushed it all the way down, but he's holding it. He's not letting go. Then I close it, I say closed, and then up. Up. And then repeat that like probably five or six times each caliper until you start seeing the pads moving. Watch this. All right, it's kind of hard to tell, but the brakes are moving. And with it down, they work. I can't move it. And you know, my hand has 
like 300 foot pounds of torque. And there you have it. The front coil over is done. We have our 0304 Cobra rotors with our 04 to 07 CTS V brake calipers. Now it's time for the rears and then some wheels. With the front all done, we have to replace the rears and I will be upgrading the rear brakes. I'm gonna go with Evo 8 Brembos in the back. Supposedly those fit the best, but I don't have every single part. So that'll be in the next Eclipse video for now. This should be even easier than the front. First, we have one bolt at the bottom. That doesn't want to remove itself. Hang on, the battery was getting weak. Just got a fresh one in there. Oh yeah, no problem. Ooh, I caught it too. I'm sorry, I don't mean to harp on this, but just look at how nice this bolt is. This is a 1995 car. It's just beautiful. From inside the car, you just remove a plastic cover and then you can remove this piece of rubber on the top to expose your strut. And this car did also have adjustable struts on it already, but they're not adjustable for ride height, only rebound and compression, or possibly only one of those even. And they're probably like 20 years old. From there, you just have two 14s. Okay, yep, I think I lost one of the 14s. Where did it go? Here or here? I don't even know. Oh my gosh, I had to pull screws out and everything, but I finally got my magnet on it. That was fun. You should just pull right out now. Just like that. Again, don't hit your car. Gosh, why does this always line up perfectly with hitting your car? Like they can't go out the bottom. There's too much stuff in the way. They have to come out this way. You just gotta get the best angle. Hang on, we gotta remove this arm. Now we still can't go out the bottom, but this should give me enough room. There we go, I'm out the top. Okay, not bad, not bad. We had to do uh, a total of four bolts for the rear. Super easy, you guys could definitely do these at home. This is gonna be one of those install and reverse order, and I've already loosened this up so we can adjust the ride height easily. So we'll have to do one of these. Oh yeah, there we go. And this is so easy, we can rest to the bottom here and now go tighten up our 14s. I'm gonna put this back on, but we might have to remove that later to adjust how this thing rides. Tighten up the control arm nut next. And last but not least, the bottom shock bolt. Why do they say last but not least? I mean, that's the last, that's it, and the least. It's, we're done, that's it, look. It's installed. We do have to adjust ride height right now, but with the suspension all done on the passenger side, let me show you my new wheels from my friends at Fitment Industries. You guys ready? You guys ready? You guys ready? Here they are. I went with some Anki wheels and this is my version of a flash forward. So these wheels are really similar to the factory wheels on an Evo 8. They used a six spoke Anki. They're not identical, but very, very close. And so I'm calling it a flash forward because, you know, the Evo 8 is newer than this car, but it's old enough to be like a flash back, but it's technically a flash forward for the Eclipse, if that makes any sense. It's, I don't know, it's very kind of like time travel-y related, as you guys know I love. But I think these are gonna look amazing on the Eclipse. It's a very period correct kind of proper wheel for this car, in my opinion. It sort of pays homage, you know, to the Evo. And I went with probably the best tires ever, the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. So these are great performance tires and the fitment is amazing because the guys at Fitment Industries are awesome for not only steering and suspension parts, but wheels and tires. So I will drop that information down below. But anyway, let's get these mounted up and see what they look like. Oh, and you guys are probably wondering what in the world this is, but GM, like the actual company, reached out and they saw my Escalade and van videos and they're like, you like full-size GM stuff? I'm like, yes. They're like, uh, you wanna borrow a Silverado High Country with the six-cylinder turbo diesel and Super Cruise? And well, I said yes. So this is my overnight parts from Japan mobile, except it's, it's not exactly a lightning, but it is super, super nice. The interior is amazing. And I was so excited to try out Super Cruise, which is GM's version of autopilot. It works really well. And I've been driving this for like a week and it gets like 25 miles per gallon with mixed city and highway. That is amazing for a big pickup truck. All right, let's go Yankees. Let's mount you up. Oh, and I went with a 235 40 18. So we're still running 18 by eight, which is exactly what the old wheels are. Here we go, here we go. All right, cool. So we should not need any spacers in the rear, even when we go with the larger brake calipers. Let me show you. Because there's a ton of room in here, but guys, 
Are you kidding me? This looks so good. Let's get some lugs on here. I have a couple different options and then our center cap. Whoa, I'm so excited. This looks great. I can't wait to do the fronts with the brakes behind them and the silver and everything. Oh man. Here are options for lugs. We can go with this guy with the cap. I've used that on many cars. This here, although I don't know if I have the right size, or a lot of guys, especially when they go with longer wheel studs, will do these, but I don't know about these. Yeah. I don't know if I can do that. Let's put the center cap in to make this complete. Yeah, I know this is kind of a style on imports. I'm just, I'm not a huge fan. I just want something, I guess, more flush and just a little cleaner where it's capped off. I don't like the fact that this is open. Here's what this style looks like. And then they each get a little cap that pushes in like that. Yeah, I think this looks much better. We'll peel off our protective little sticker thing there and Oh, that's what I'm talking about, guys. That looks much cleaner in my opinion. And I love the black caps with the black center cap and the black Enki with their little design thing there. Oh, this is beautiful. And look at how it matches the factory gray on the side skirts. And I was thinking about having that painted to match the body color because I think that's what the facelifted 2G Eclipse has had. But now I'm I'm really considering just leaving it. That is kind of really cool. All right, so here's where we're at with fitment. This really doesn't mean much because we have to set the ride height, but it's pretty close. We might have to get these rolled. And this is the fitment I'm going for on the Eclipse. So on the E55 wagon, I think this is just perfect. I don't rub or hit anything, but I did have these rolled on the inside. And yeah, I think the Eclipse would look really nice like this. I'm also a big fan of having this flush or slightly sunken in. I don't want it to stick out. All right, guys. Big moment here, big moment. Front wheels are going on with the calipers. Ah, oh, I already think the color just looks great. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Okay, yeah, definitely needed that spacer. These fit, but very, very close fitment to the caliper, but we're gonna be good. Oh. I still have to put the little black plastic caps on, but I might have to take the wheel off to adjust the ride height uh, for the suspension and all that, which we're gonna do here in a moment. But wow, I think this looks so Good, and I love this Cadillac color with the wheels. Is there any world that leaving the V on makes any sense at all? Like, I, I kind of really like it. It looks cool, it makes absolutely no sense. And I'm gonna have to paint the rear calipers the same color anyway, so I could totally get rid of it, but I don't know. I don't know. Let me know in the comments, would you leave the V? I mean, the, the CTS-V and this have like nothing to do with each other. I just like how it looks individually. I don't know. Well, this has got me a little worried. The tire is poking out. I had to run the spacer though for the brakes. And these are the trials and tribulations of wheel and tire fitment. So we're still up in the air. This could settle in, um, but this is what I was talking about with camber. I might have to camber the top in, uh, roll the fender, stuff like that. So it is what it is. We'll, we'll get there. All right, guys, driver's side is all done. Let's lower the eclipse. Here we go. About to touch down. All right. How does it look guys? I'm, I'm on that side. So yeah. Oh, Okay, yeah, this looks pretty good. Wow, I mean, it's coming in. It's definitely coming in. So this is like the factory ride height that they set it at. So we don't have too much adjusting to do. Okay, so the rear is pretty good. Yeah, the rear is pretty good. Once we lower this some more and maybe get some camber bolts, I think the rear is gonna be perfect. And here we go. This is the real world poke that we're dealing with, but we still have to go down quite a bit. And man, Camber can fix this. And I'm not talking about going full blown Camber gang where the wheels are like, or depending on which way you're looking at it. We're not doing that. All right, now to adjust the ride height, it's pretty easy. We're gonna leave these alone because they just have to do with the spring rate. And then you can turn this by hand. So basically these threads are gonna go into this cylinder. So you can go up and down. And as long as this is moving with it, you know you're not messing with the spring rate. This is locked in to this center shaft. So this is probably gonna take me quite a few tries, but we're gonna lower this guy. All right, I've made adjustments on both sides a few times. This last one should do the trick. And before I put the wheels back on, I just wanna point out that I'm not going to run this spacer. This was just for test fitting. I have a bunch of these in the shop. You wanna get these hub centric with the lip there because then the wheel can ride on that. It's just, it's a little better. You, you can get away with this, but it's around the same price just to get these that are better because the factory hub would have a lip that the wheel sits on to kind of center it. Just make sure you're getting the right bore. So in ordering up your spacer, you need to know 
the bolt pattern. So this is five by one fourteen or five by four and a half inches. And then also this has a 67 millimeter bore. So when you're searching for these, some of them have a 58, a 72. You got to get the bore size right. All right. After making a few adjustments, this is what I've come up with for now. This is about as low as I want to go before driving the car because it will settle a little bit, but it's already looking so, so good. Oh, with the big brakes, it's perfect. I can't wait to get the Evo 8 brakes in the rear. But now I'm going to torque the wheels, get the little caps on, and we got to go for a ride, to, you know, to get the suspension to settle in because I really, really want to go for a ride. You know what I forgot to even really look at is if this tucked in much more. And it did. Wow, that is really getting there, guys. That is good. And the rear, okay, now that the rear is a little bit lower, I think I could go a little bit more in the rear, but yeah, no, this is gonna be great. This is so weird, guys. This car is so low now. Like, here, look at this. That's all. <laughs> oh, it feels kind of cool, though. It was, it, was, it was pretty jacked up before. It was higher than stock. Running good, though. First time turning the wheel. Okay, everything feels normal. Oh, that first drive with new tires, it's picking everything up. <laughs> Oh, it's brutal. Good thing I haven't had this car painted yet. Oh, just rock chips galore. Woo, I just scraped for the first time. <laughs> this thing's definitely lowered. I gotta hit that ramp at an angle now before I could go over anything. It was, it was lifted. Hey, alignment's still good. I didn't really mess with too many alignment angles there. This base tune feels great. No hesitation, nothing. Perfect air fuel. Oh, this ride is beautiful, guys. I don't need to touch the ride at all. Are you kidding me right now? Every other time I've done coilovers, it's just so stiff. This spring rate is perfect. And they have it factory adjusted, supposedly to be around stock, and I believe it. It's totally good. We can mess with the little knobs on top for compression and rebound and all that kind of good stuff, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Definitely for a while. No rub on anything. I, I mean, I don't have a front bumper, but we shouldn't be rubbing. Oh, I love this car. That turbo just wants to light up. I mean, I'm at like eighth throttle and you hear it just, it just wants to rip guys. I'm so glad I went with a smaller turbo and I didn't just go crazy with the biggest one possible for the most peak horsepower. This is gonna feel good down low and have a ton of torque for a four cylinder. Oh, sorry, I got, I got big boots on. <laughs> I let off the clutch and my foot was stuck on the accelerator a little there. Oh, this feels so good. My tuner said, no 30 PSI rips, Alex. It's on a base tune. I'm like, all right, 20 PSI rips? Now that's a legit street car. Look at that, a Woody wagon. That dude is awesome. Oh, he's got custom plates too. I don't know what that means. Wash washer for something? I don't know. That is so cool. Oh, this is great, guys. Oh. I mean, the car already handled really well, but it feels great. And we're still running factory sway bars and everything. I don't see a need to upgrade. Ah, oh, so many rocks, guys. This is brutal. All right, let's take a look from outside. First, let's give it some, some revs. Look at that solid air fuel, perfect idle. 18 inches of vacuum, that's really healthy. My favorite part. We take the key out. It's still running because it has like a 1998 turbo timer and you give it a few seconds and it will eventually, and I'm gonna keep on talking, die. It'll die. I nailed that one, perfect. So I've driven this car maybe a grand total of like one mile. And one of the big perks to living in Chicago and around Chicago is that we have some of the worst potholes in the entire world. And you guys may think that's bad, but it's actually good if you wanna settle the suspension when you install fresh coils on your car and you don't wanna wait too long. You just, you hit a bunch of potholes, it settles it, and then you know your ride height. So. You know, just, I like to look at the positive. And because of this wonderful Illinois suspension settling pothole initiative, they, they do it on purpose for us. We've settled the suspension, I think quite a bit. And guys, this is, I did not think it was gonna get this good. Do you guys remember the poke that we had going on? It's pretty much all but gone. I, I think I'm gonna lower the car just a little bit more after we get the fenders rolled. And once I do that, I don't think I actually need to do anything with camber. 
at all. Like I, I think the amount that we spaced it out with the 10 millimeters, which is about the max I'd go with this style or the hub centric with the lip spacers, much more than that. You either want to get a different wheel or look into some different style spacers. But anyway, with the 10 millimeters, this is mint guys. I mean, seriously, look at this. It's perfect. It's just like the E55 in the front. Actually the rear could use a little bit of space out, just a tiny bit, and then that would be perfect as well. So I might have to do some longer studs, and I'll do that when I do the Evo 8 brakes, which I do have an order. I cannot wait, and I'm gonna paint them the silver color, and I don't, I, I think I might leave the V. Hang on, it's, it's covered up there. So many people use the CTS-V brake calipers, and they never leave the V, and they usually put something like Brembo or something to do with their car on there. No one like pays homage to the V. We're stealing all the brake calipers from the 04 to 07 V. I think I'm gonna be one of the only ones to represent the CTS V. It's a car I absolutely love, and you know what? I wanna tell the world that my Mitsubishi Eclipse has CTS V brake calipers. Yeah, and it really just matches so well. So this is the final product with the caps and with the center cap and, and, and everything. And I, I even like this too. It's very period correct paying homage to the Evo 8. And I think there were a few other Evos that had the Enki wheels like this. But here you have it guys, a complete E85 capable fuel system. Hey, hang on, I gotta do this on the other side. This just, I know the car's rough. I mean like the paint looks like this, but the beauty of white cars, it's mint. I think about right, yeah, right here, it's mint. You, you can't even tell. But hang on, I'm gonna do it from the passenger side that's mostly complete, but here you go, complete E85 fuel system upgraded, brakes in the front upgraded, suspension lowered. The fitment is almost there, it's like 90% there. And this car is just gonna look so complete once I do the facelifted wing and the front and rear bumpers and the side skirts and a paint job and all that good stuff. Oh, and I have new leather for the front seat, so it's gonna be the factory style, that's how I wanted it. The interior is gonna look almost almost bone stock when I'm done. We're gonna replace the headliner and a bunch of little trim as well. And so much more. So I think in the next video, we need to get this thing on the dyno, fully tuned by the Tuning Twins. They're the guys that are also doing the GTR and my CL65. They've tuned a bunch of DSMs. That's actually how they got started. So really cool to kind of give them a throwback car because they don't see these very often anymore. So I have a bunch of mechanical stuff to do before we hit the dyno just to make sure it's 100%. And then this way, we don't have to take anything else apart on the car. It'll be mechanically sorted, tuned, finished, so we can start the big cosmetic restoration. So anyway, super excited. Uh, GTR parts are on order. It's at Fluid Motor Union. They're working on the exhaust. So this is a perfect time to work on kind of the GTR's little grandfather. Baby grandfather? I don't know what this is related to the GTR, but it's kind of related. So I'm gonna try and at least have this ready and at the paint shop for when we get back into the GTR. That'll be perfect. So anyway, hope you guys really enjoyed this video. Hope you learned something. If you did, give this video a big thumbs up. Share the video with your friends and family. Subscribe if for some crazy reason you haven't subscribed already. Do you like eclipses and GTRs and Trans Ams and Ford Taurus shows and Cobras and Lightnings and a bunch of AMG cars and weird stuff like Lowrider, Fieros and supercharged NFL Suburbans? I don't know, I've had all sorts of weird cars. If you like cars at all, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free, it really helps me out. But most importantly, have a fantastic day and I'll see all of you in the next video. Away right here. No, oh, okay. Oh my gosh. That's a really awesome way to start a scene. Where are you? So much like the fuel hose that failed. So much like the fuel hose that. And by 13s, I mean not 13s at all. That's doing nothing. And now we can remove the 312 mil that. Once you're confident that the inject. Okay. Oh, and some. Tighten this with a wrench and you've now. Uh, tighten this with. Tighten these two up with a wrench and now, tighten these two up with a wrench and you've now, first step in removing, first step in, first step in, um, first step in something. First step in a uh, brain fart or freeze. Upgrading. Upgrading, that's the word. Okay. Okay. It's done. Wow. Focus on the bolt. Oh, ooh. Seriously, camera? Like what, what are you doing right now? There we go.